Good morning, church. Good morning. And uh, it is by God's grace that we finally come to the fifth series of uh, this uh, sermon on Jonah. Okay. And today I title this sermon rather strange God's Scandalous Grace. Okay, um, I'll tell you why I title it Scandal. Okay, let me begin by. Oops. Uh huh. Okay. Now, when scandalous news break out, let me ask you this question. What is your reaction? Especially when our former Malaysian Prime Minister was jailed for the SRC financial scandal. And lately, on the news, you discover that uh, they are talking about his fines been reduced and possibly even finishing his sentence in house arrest. Scandal. Not only that, there is also the ongoing 1MDB graph scandal involving our Malaysian prime, ex-prime minister. Then there is also the world-famous evangelist an apologist, sexual scandal. And uh, I think about a few years ago, Japan released the Fukushima nuclear waste, water waste into the Pacific Ocean. So much so, many of us dare not eat any seafood. Scandal, right? What's your reaction? Let me tell you, there are also many scandals, even in the Bible. And that's why you may wonder why I titled my sermon this morning, God's Scandalous Grace. Oops, sorry. I think... You see, the answer to scandalous sin is scandalous grace, God's scandalous grace. When we often speak of God's grace, we say it is amazing. That's why we sing amazing grace, right? But let's take a moment and think about how offensive, how outrageous, how disgraceful and despicable, how those scandals that were committed by individuals that were overturned by God's grace. It is totally unmerited, undeserved. And let me give you some examples from the Bible. One of them is Judah, and Judah had three sons, okay? Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And so Judah got a wife named Tamar, okay, for his firstborn, Ur, okay, the firstborn son, who later died. And so Judah got his second son, okay, Onan, to fulfill okay, his duty in order to produce offspring for his dead brother. And Onan, in his sexual act, we, to we were told, okay, he kind of uh, take off his uh, you know, sexual organ okay, at that time and uh, remove the sperm instead of pregnanting uh, the wife, Tama, and he was put to death for this wickedness. And so Judah was afraid to give the third son just in case the same fate will fall upon 
the third son. And you know what? Judah slept with Tamar. Can you imagine? The father slept with the daughter-in-law, thinking that she was actually a prostitute out in the street. But did you know that in the New Testament, I like for us to read because it's very interesting. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Can we read together? This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brother. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Wow, can you imagine? Okay, the father slept with the daughter-in-law and gave birth to Perez and Zerah. And later on, we saw that this resulted in Jesus' family tree. Scandalous, but amazing. Another one. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, it reads that Joshua, son of Nun, okay, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. And so they went and entered the house of a prostitute. Again, a prostitute. Okay? The, the earlier one, Presumed to be a prostitute, but not a prostitute. But this one is a prostitute. Name Rahab. And stayed there with them. And Rahab also in the story tells us, put the rope down to let the two spies escape. Okay? But very interesting, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse later on became the father of King David. And we know that resulted in Jesus' family tree. Another scandal. God overturned. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12, all of you are very familiar with this story about King David's adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba happens to be the wife of Uriah, one of King David's army men. Okay? And here in Matthew chapter 1 verse 6, it says, Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. See, King David's affair with Bathsheba, and not only that, even committed murder of Uriah, resulted in Jesus' family tree. Now, as much as Jonah captures the headline of this book of Jonah, I want you to understand this, that the real hero is not Jonah, but it is God himself. And the purpose of this book is really about God's love and His scandalous grace in reaching out to the lost. Let's pray. Father, at the ministry of your word right now, as we open the Bible, we ask that you open our hearts to you. 
and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. So let's recap what we have been looking at. Okay? The first sermon, the first series I talk about, God's undeserving grace reaches out to this fugitive prophet Jonah who ran away from God's calling to go to Nineveh. Instead, he went the opposite direction to Tarshish and brings us to that one simple choice. We can either be Jonah or learn to be Jesus. The second part of the sermon, I talk about God's pursuing grace in the storm of life. Okay. Jonah, remember, while he was on the ship to Tarshish, okay, God sent a big storm, just like the rainstorm we had yesterday, last night. Okay. And in that storm, Jonah said, Throw me overboard, okay? And all of you will be safe. That shows God's heart for the world around us in saving the pagan sailors, in saving the pagan captain of the ship. Then, when Jonah was thrown overboard, God is not done with him yet. He sent actually a big fish to swallow him up. And we learn about God's inundating grace even finds us in the outer darkness of life. For Jonah, it was in the belly of the fish. Then we talk about God's boundless grace gives us the second chance to start all over again. Jonah was given the second chance to go back to the Nineveh and preach the message. No matter how outrageous and despicable our human sins are, we shall see today that God will never write off anybody through his scandalous grace whenever you and I are willing to repent of our sin. Now against this backdrop of Assyria as I was talking to you, mentioning how atrocious, how evil the Assyrian Empire is, okay? and Jonah was to go to this city of Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire. It is one of Israel's most dreadful enemies. We know from history, okay, that um, the Assyrians came and took the Israelites into captivity. And I mentioned how atrocious, okay, how evil this nation is. That when in the Old Testament, when these people, the Israelites, were taken into captivity, they were taken by a fish hook on their noses, dragged all the way to Assyria. And archaeological evidence show Nineveh's cruelty. The question is that God is telling us what he did to Jonah He's asking us this morning, will we continue to take his message, the message of his grace, to these worst offenders? Knowing Nineveh's atrocious crimes, okay, Jonah decides to run away from God's call. But God got his attention by allowing him to be swallowed up by a big fish. 
And when Jonah got his senses back, God's word came to him a second time to go to Nineveh. And we found out that given the second chance, Jonah went, okay? but with great reluctance in his heart because his heart was never for the pagan Ninevites. He preached and said that 40 days, the whole city of Nineveh will be overturned. But he didn't want these people to turn back to the Lord. See, Jonah had some issues with God's program because Jonah actually wants revenge and not mercy. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, it ends with this beautiful crescendo. Let's read this because it tells us about God's heart. Together, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. So when we turn to Jonah chapter 4, we're kind of expecting triumph, but we found quite the opposite. Instead of applauding okay, that God was being gracious to the Ninevites, we find Jonah was very angry. And instead of rejoicing, we find Jonah rejecting God. And instead of gratitude, we find Jonah grumbling. So let's take a look at Jonah's reaction in chapter 4, verse 1. Let's take a look at Jonah, chapter 4, verse 1. Okay? But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Remember earlier, we saw that God saw what these people did and how they turned from their evil ways. God relented. And to Jonah, he says, this is very wrong, and he became angry utterly angry with God. So this brings us to our first point. Acknowledging our bitterness through God's scandalous grace. See, Jonah's hatred and prejudice against the Assyrians are so compelling that he didn't want them to receive God's mercy and blessing. Jonah is very angry and hoping that God will overthrow and destroy Nineveh in 40 days' time. And saw that Jonah is so outrageously angry at God because God actually made him a channel of his divine blessings to his arch rival and enemy the Ninevites. Take a look again at verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. Not angry at himself, but angry at God for saving the Ninevites. If you are taking down your notes, okay, Here's something I want you to take down. Okay? Getting angry at God doesn't work at all, ever. If you can underline that, getting angry at God doesn't work at all. How many of you have been angry in your lifetime? I have. I will be the first one to admit. Why? It's because I always have anger issues since young. When I cannot get anything I want, 
I would throw temper tantrums. So much so, my mother would say to me and to the rest of the family, This Translated, it means this little tiger is very fierce. Why call me little tiger? Well, that's because I was born in the year of the tiger. And let me also tell you something very interesting about my nickname. Okay. My mother used to call me B-Boy. Many of us, we have very nice nicknames called Boy Boy or Good Boy, right? But later I found out, I said, Mom, why you call me B-Boy? B stands for what? It's a, actually a euphemism called Bad Boy. That's how naughty I was. Now we can be as angry at God for all we want. That doesn't make us right. And it isn't going to change God's plan. Here, God has just rescued an entire city from destruction of their sinfulness because they repented. What should have been the proper and right response? For many of us, we would say, praise the Lord, right? But instead of praising God, Jonah gets angry at God. Jonah couldn't care about God saving that 120,000 people in that city. And often we are like Jonah in our so-called righteous anger. We are blinded to the great things that God is doing in the world. Why? Basically, it's because we didn't get our own way. We didn't get to call the shots. We didn't get to play God. Does it work to be angry at God? Again, like I say, if you're taking down notes, write these four letters. Okay? Four words, not four letters. Four words in bold capital letter. I am not God. You are not God. I'm not God. We don't get to call the shots. God is the one who gets to call the shots. So what happened next in verse 2? This is what Jonah did. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew. You see, Jonah knows his God very well. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. See, Jonah is brutally honest here. Now, while I don't think it's ang it is good to be angry at God, but I do think that it is good to be honest with God when we are. And Jonah comes right out and says, I'm so angry because I hated these people. And I know you, God, would save them if you give them a chance. You see, God is a God of second chances. Not only of second, third, fourth, whenever we are willing to repent, God is willing to forgive. And God does that 
through his son Jesus Christ who forgive us of our sins on the basis of Christ's death on the cross. That is why God says, I can forgive you now. Then in verse 3, it reads, O Lord, now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, if you were to read this short chapter, in chapter 4 alone, three times Jonah says this, for it is better for me to die than to live. That's how angry he was with God. Three times. This is the first time he said. Jonah says that he would rather die than to live in a world where his enemies are followers of Yahweh. It is bad enough that, God, that Jonah didn't want to partner with God to save the Gentile Ninevites. He now shows his deep-seated hatred and bitterness. Yes, we are to hate sin, but never the sinner. God's, Jonah's anger and bitterness has blinded him, and this is truly a very sad story. That brings us to the second point. Transform our bitterness with God's scandalous grace. Let's read Jonah chapter 4, verse 4. But the Lord replied to Jonah, he says, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah, what right do you have to be angry? God rebukes Jonah for his sinfulness. And as we shall see in the rest of this story, Jonah ignores God's rebuke. In verse 5, it says, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to that city. See, the story gets more and more depressing for Jonah. He admits that he knows God would forgive the Ninevites. And now in verse 5, we see that Jonah leaves the city. Then he set up a camp, hoping against all hope to see if God would change his mind and destroy the enemies from a very safe distance, just in case God changed his mind and sent fire and brimstone on this city. That's why he moved out of the city and waited to see whether God would do something or not. Verse 6 tells us, Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Not about God, but about the plant. Out of nowhere, there's this huge leafy plant that springs up so big that it provided a big shade over Jonah's head. And when the vine, vine grows up, Jonah sees this as a blessing from God. And he's very happy about the plant. My question is to all of us, do you think God is actually looking out for Jonah? Do you think God is actually looking out for Jonah? Does God really want Jonah to be comfortable? 
Let me tell you the answer is actually no. Why? Because the next two verses tells us, but whenever you read the word English but, it means the opposite already. But at the dawn of the next day, God provided a worm which chew up the plant so that it wither. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, this is the second time he's saying this, it would be better for me to die than to live. Did Jonah learn his lesson? No. Because in verse 8, at the end of verse 8, Jonah says this is the second time. It would be better for me to die than to live. You see, Jonah still doesn't get it. He would rather die because he knows that God is showing him who is calling the shots. He knows that when the Ninevites repented, God is always gracious and will not judge them. God sends the vine not as a blessing, but to get Jonah's attention with the worm eating up the huge plant. Then in verse 9, but God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about that plant? It is, he said. I'm so angry. I wish I were dead. This is the third time, he says. I'm so angry. I wish I were dead. See, Jonah still doesn't get it. His anger and bitterness taints everything. He gets angry because he's so self-focused on the loss of the plant. He's adamantly stubborn. Like Jonah, many of us, when we start digging a hole for ourselves, Rather than doing the right thing in filling up the hole that we have been digging, we stick to our guns, digging deeper and deeper. Our anger makes us unreasonable and irrational. When we get angry like Jonah, you know, we make bad choices and we missed out on God's scandalous grace of blessing. Instead of admitting our wrongs and repent, we would rather let this root of bitterness destroy our relationship with God and with others. Here we read God's heart for his creation ending in verse 10 and 11. But Jonas, but the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tan it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I have not concern for the great city of Nineveh, which more than 120,000 who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. See, Jonah is more concerned about the vine or the plant, the plant that he didn't plant at all, than the 120,000 Ninevites that God is saving. And when God says that the 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand 
from the left hand, God is telling us that they are morally and spiritually unaware. Jonah is willing to have compassion on the plant, but not on the pagan Ninevites. And he's very angry at God for saving them. You see, Jonah's priorities are being displaced. He does not appear to care about what really God cares about. The book of Jonah actually has one of the most shocking endings in a form of a tragedy in all of the Bible. But again, it highlights God's scandalous grace for undeserving people. On the surface, it appears the book of Jonah that we have no resolution to this story. But we must remember who is the hero of this narrative. Let me tell you, it is all about God, not about Jonah. Jonah's legacy stands as a warning to us and as a testament to God's say, amazing grace. See, the whole book of Jonah points us to the greatness of God's amazing grace. While the story isn't written in such a way that we don't have a specific conclusion how the story ended for Jonah, but I think we can learn a few things that will continue to point us to God's undeserving, pursuing, inundating, boundless, and scandalous grace. So I would like for us to take time to reflect on what God's scandalous grace means to you and to me. In conclusion, perhaps we are that person Maybe we have committed outrageous sin and are in need of God's scandalous grace. Perhaps we even doubt that our sins can be forgiven or God would not accept us because of what we have done or how we have failed Him or where we have been. But God is saying, my child, if you are willing to come back, my arms are always open to you. We need to know that there is no other kind of grace. In God's economy, there is only God's unmerited, scandalous grace. No matter how all the scandals, all the outrageous sin that we have committed in our lives. There are three applications that I like to leave with you as we end. Very easy. ABC. Okay? Remember all this ABC. A stands for admit that we are sinners. No matter how foul our sins are. We need His grace. Second B stands for believe, always believe this, that Christ has paid the price of our sins on that cross. There's nothing you and I can do to earn God's grace. Nothing. Nothing at all. 
it has already been accomplished at the cross. So believe that Christ has paid for all of your sins and my sins on the cross. C stands for confess that we desperately need God's scandalous grace to transform our most deceitful hearts by the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your grace. Your outrageous grace. Even though we have sinned against you, yet you continue to reach out to us whenever we are willing to come back to you. You welcome us with open arms. We thank you, Lord, for your scandalous grace because Christ died for our sins on the cross. And for this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.